Hi everyone and welcome to the third video about the security of quantum key distribution. In the last video I said that this time we will talk about entropies. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but actually we won't talk about entropies in this video. Because before we can talk about entropies, we have to talk about composite systems, which means that you have a Hilbert space, which is a tensor product of Hilbert spaces. So in this video, we will talk about how to mathematically describe composite systems. We'll talk about the kind of states that arise in these systems and also the quantum phenomena, for example, entanglement, which you probably have heard of. And also at the end of the video, we will see the no cloning theorem and we will understand why it is not possible to perfectly clone arbitrary quantum states. This is the picture of a general quantum experiment that we discussed in the last video. Suppose now that this is the situation in Alice's lab. So she prepares a quantum state row A, she sends the quantum state through a quantum channel EA, and finally she measures the state with a measurement MA and gets a classical outcome XA. So this completely happens in Alice's lab. In addition to this, we can think about that uh, Bob has the exact same situation in his lab. So he prepares a quantum state row B. This quantum state is sent through a quantum channel EB and finally measured by a measurement MB. These are two completely independent quantum experiments that do not influence each other in any way. So whatever happens in Bob's lab, it has no influence on what happens in Alice's lab. But of course, we can still view this as one system where two individual quantum experiments take place. In this case, we would describe the situation with tensor products of quantum states, like the state of the composite system is row A tensor row B, the, quantums, the quantum channel that is applied is EA tensor EB, and the measurement in the end is also a tensor product measurement MAM tensor MB. So this is a very simple way of getting a composite system. You just take two completely independent quantum experiments and view them as one system. But of course, this is not everything that can happen, because otherwise we would not need a whole video to talk about composite systems. So in the following, we will explore what else there is besides product states and product evolutions. And of course, we will begin the study with the Hilbert space. As we said in the last video, whenever we have some sort of quantum system, we have to uh, specify the underlying Hilbert space. So in this video, I will mostly talk about bipartite systems, which means we have two parties, for example, Alice and Bob, and the Hilbert space is a tensor product of two Hilbert spaces, HA and HB. But of course, you could have multiple parties, so it isn't restricted to two parties. And then you have a tensor product of multiple Hilbert spaces. Most of the things that we talk about in this video also apply to multipartite Hilbert spaces, unless I uh, state it otherwise. <clears throat> okay, so we have a tensor product Hilbert space here. and the first thing we need to think about is what uh, can what how the basis of this Hilbert space looks like. So the subsystem Hilbert spaces H A and H B they each come with um, a basis for the subsystem. We will denote the basis of H A with vectors E I and the basis of H B with vectors F J. And we can use these bases of the subsystems to construct the basis of the tensor product Hilbert space. And this is in a very straightforward way. So the basis of the tensor product Hilbert space is just given by a tensor product of the basis states of the subsystem Hilbert space. And here we take every combination of vectors EI and FJ that is possible. And this directly leads to a formula for the dimension of the tensor product Hilbert space. Because we take every possible combination of basis states in the tensor product, the dimension of the tensor product Hilbert space is just the product of the dimensions of the subsystem Hilbert spaces. Uh, 
a short comment on the notation that I use. So above, I have really written out the tensor product of the states, but this is a very lengthy way of expressing that. So we can make our lives easier and just leave out the tensor product symbol. So whenever there are two cat vectors next to each other, this is the same as the tensor product of these two cat vectors, because there's no other way to interpret this. And we can even go one step further and just write the symbols for the vectors, so E and F, into one cat vector. If we want to uh, indicate that the vectors belong to system A or system B, as we did uh, above in the Hilbert space notation, then we can put subscripts on the vectors. So here I've put the subscript A on the vector E to denote that this is a vector in the subsystem A. And then the same kind of notation can be used when we have cat vectors with subscripts. For mixed states, everything goes analogously. So if I have a state row A for on system A and a state row B on system B, then I can just take the tensor product of these two density matrices. So in the composite Hilbert space, I have a state row A tensor row B. Let's have a look at a simple example of a composite system. <clears throat> So in the last video, we have talked about qubits, but of course, having only one qubit is usually a really boring situation. So mostly we're interested in systems of multiple qubits. And here we'll look at the example of having two qubits. So remember that um, a one qubit space has the computational basis as one basis that we can choose. This was denoted by states 0 and 1. And the vector representation of these states is for the 0 state, it's the vector 1, 0. And for the 1 state, it's the vector 0, 1. <clears throat> if we have a system of two qubits, we can assign a computational basis to each of these subsystems. And the basis of the composite Hilbert space is then given by the tensor product of the one qubit basis. So we have to take every possible combination of the zeros and ones to get the basis of the two qubit space. And as you can see, we now have four basis states, which fits perfectly with the dimension formula we had before. So the dimension of the one qubit space is two. And when we have two uh, of the one qubit spaces, then the, the dimension of the two qubit space has to be four. What is the vector representation of this basis of the two qubit space? Well, we have a vector representation of the one qubit basis, and now we can just take the algebraic tensor product of vectors to get the vector representation of the two qubit space. Here you can see an example for the calculation of the state zero, zero. And as you can see in the end, we get a four dimensional vector with a one in the upper place. And analogous calculations give vector representations for the other states, so that in the end, you have these four, um, these four vectors that obviously form a basis. So given this basis, a general two qubit state that we denote psi is then just a linear combination of these four basis states with coefficients alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And if we write them as a vector, then we just, given this basis that we chose, we just have a vector with four entries, and these four entries are the coefficients uh, in the linear combination. Of course, these coefficients have to fulfill some normalization condition so that um, this uh, vector psi is actually a physical state. <laughs> okay, so we have seen lots of product states. And we have seen how we can, uh, given states in the subsystems, how we can form composite states of them. But as I mentioned in the introduction, there's more to this than product states. Okay. We, will, we are again in a Hilbert space HA tensor HB, and I will leave this Hilbert space in the corner above 
so I don't always have to write down in which Hilbert space we are. You just remember this because it stays there the whole time. Okay, a very simple situation. We have a tensor product of zero states. One state is in the A system, which is Alice's system, and the other state is in Bob's system. This is the composite state. And for this state, we can definitely say that Alice's qubit is in the state zero and Bob's qubit is also in the state zero. There's no uncertainty about the state uh, of the individual qubits. Okay, but what about this quantum state? It's obviously a quantum state in the composite Hilbert space, but now we have a superposition of states. So we have the tensor product of zero states in both Alice and Bob's qubits, and the, uh, we add to it the tensor product of one state. Now, um, it's a bit more difficult to say in which state Alice's qubit is or in which state Bob's qubit is. It's not obvious. Very naively, you could say that, oh, hmm, maybe Alice's qubit is in the superposition 0 plus 1, and Bob's qubit also, but if you take the tensor product of these two states, then you quickly see that it is not the same as the state above. So there's no obvious way to say what the what states the individual qubits are in. Okay, we'll see the state here more often throughout this talk, so we give it a name. It is called the phi plus state. Okay, this leads us to the definition of entanglement. And if we have a pure bipartite state Psi on a system HA tensor HB, then we say that this state is entangled if it cannot be written as a product state. So if there are no states Phi A and Phi B such that the product, the tensor product of these two states gives the state Psi, then Psi is an entangled state. <clears throat> so for pure bipartite state, there's a theorem which is very useful if we want to uh, figure out if a state that we are given is entangled. And this is the Schmidt decomposition. So if you have a pure bipartite state, Psi, on the tensor product Hilbert space HA tensor HB, then this state can always be written in the following form, namely as a sum over coefficients lambda i, and then um, the tensor product of basis states in Alice's and in Bob's system. So the tensor product EI tensor FI, and we sum this from over i from one to the so-called Schmidt rank D. And the coefficients lambda i, they have to be strictly positive, and the, um, the lambda i squared have to sum up to 1. And the Schmidt rank D is less or equal the, the minimum over the dimensions. So you take the two dimensions of the subsystem Hilbert spaces, and D is always smaller or equal to the smaller of these dimensions. This is actually quite a remarkable feature because suppose Alice has a, a qubit, so a two-dimensional system, but Bob has some really large system like with dimension 1 billion or something like that, then you can always find a subspace in Bob's system such that um, the the Schmidt decomposition only includes the subspace of Bob's system. Okay, this is remarkable, but another remarkable feature about the Schmidt decomposition is that it tells us whether the state is entangled. If, you ha if the state Psi is an entangled state, then the Schmidt rank D is always strictly greater than 1. So by uh, taking the Schmidt decomposition and calculating 
uh, and figuring out the Schmidt rank, you can tell whether your state is entangled or a product state. And if we go back to the example that we had before, phi plus, then we can easily figure out the Schmidt decomposition because it's basically written there. We know that 0, 1 is a basis for the one qubit space. So it's already written down in the in the basis for the subsystem Hilbert spaces. And we can directly see that one coefficient lambda one is one over square root of two. And we have a second coefficient, which is also one over square root of two, which means that the Schmidt rank D is two, and therefore the state phi plus is entangled. <clears throat> so it's no surprise we couldn't figure out a product uh, state for the state phi plus. Okay, but of course, we don't always have um, we don't always have pure states. Oh, one comment about the Schmidt decomposition. This is uh, a theorem that's only applicable to bipartite, bipartite states. <clears throat> it is also applicable to multipartite states where you make a bipartition. But it's not, in this form, it's not applicable to general uh, multipartite states. Okay, but what if we don't have um, pure states? Well, there's, um, of course, also a definition of entanglement for mixed states, which is the following. If you have a bipartite state rho AB, then this is called separable, if and only if it can be written as a sum over the tensor product sigma uh, on the system A with an index X, with the state eta on the system B also with an index X, and we have coefficients Px. And the coefficients Px, they form a probability distribution. Yeah, and the states sigma and eta come from the subsystem Hilbert spaces. Okay, if you can write down this bipartite state in this form as the sum, then it is a separable state. And if you cannot write it down as the sum, then it is called entangled. Okay, so we have seen that our example state phi plus is an entangled state. Well, that means we cannot write it as a product state. But is there maybe like, can we somehow say what the state in Alice's system is, is there some sort of local density operator for Alice's system, which describes the situation that like Alice holds her qubit and she doesn't have any access to Bob's qubit, even though they're entangled. Which density operator describes this situation? Well, there's a solution to this answer, which is the partial trace. The partial trace traces out one of the subsystems. So if you have a bipartite density operator, rho AB, and you have a basis for the, for the Hilbert space HB, then the partial trace is defined as follows. So we take the partial trace over the Hilbert space HB of the state rho AB, and this is defined as the sum over, so you apply the operator um, IA, the identity on A, tensored with the basis state EI on the B system. And this is applied on both sides to the state row AB. And we sum over all the basis states of the system HB. As you can see, in the end, you will have a state which is only on the state uh, on the space A. We often neglect the identities on the A system to like make it uh, less confusing in bigger calculations. Then you only have the EI states sandwiched around the row AB state. Okay, so let's use the partial trace to actually calculate the local density operator of the state phi plus. 
so we take the partial trace over the B system of the state phi plus. And um, yeah, what we need is a, is a basis for Bob's system. But as we have seen above, so phi plus is a, a state on a two qubits uh, Hilbert space. And we know that the system for the one uh, basis for the one qubit Hilbert space is the computational basis. So we just use this to calculate the partial trace. And if you write it down, you get this more or less complicated term. And if you have a closer look, then you can see that there are only two terms which are non-zero. And these are now highlighted. So in the first row, it's the state where on Bob's system, we always have the, the zero state. And in the second row is the state where we only have the one state on Bob's system. All the other combinations, they give zeros because we combine the one state with the zero state and their scalar product always yields zero. <clears throat> so calculating this yields the, um, com the, the sum of the zero state and the one state analysis system divided by two. And this is what we call the maximally mixed state, which is denoted by pi a. So it's called the maximally mixed state because both of the basis states of the system appear with equal probability. So you can basically not gain any information from this state because all the possible basis states are equally uh, probable. Yeah. <clears throat> if you do the sum calculation for Bob's system, so we trace out Alice's system, then we get the same. We get the maximally mixed state on Bob's system. Well, does that mean that the state phi plus can be written as a tensor product of pi a and pi b? Well, certainly not, because um, then we could write the state phi plus as a tensor product and it wouldn't be entangled. So the local density operators for Alice and Bob, they describe the situation in their labs, but um, take, like tracing out one half of the system loses basically all the information. So we cannot describe this entangled state just by looking at local density operators. <clears throat> okay, another class of um, composite systems is the is our composite systems where one of the subsystems is a classical system. So we have denoted this here by using the subscript Z, which stands for like classical values Z. And the corresponding ensemble to this system is then an ensemble where the states are a tensor product of density matrices, row A with an index Z, and classical values Z that are encoded into quantum states. <clears throat> and these classical values Z, they are out of some, some set that we denoted by a calligraphic Z. And these tensor product states are then distributed by a probability distribution PZ. And here we see something that we haven't seen before, because here um, before we had ensembles always with pure states, but now the state rho A in the ensemble basically comes from an ensemble itself. So it is an ensemble of ensembles. But we can do that, of course. And the corresponding density operator that we get is then a sum over all the possible classical values Z. Um, where in the sum we have the probability distribution PZ times the tensor product states rho AZ tensor um, the state Z. Okay, this is how we can describe classical quantum ensembles by using density operators. Now, 
we also have to talk about how composite systems evolve. So what are quantum channels on composite systems? We're now back at the case where we have a tensor product of two like normal quantum Hilbert spaces as we know them. And the definition that we developed in the last video still applies. So a quantum channel is a linear, completely positive, trace-preserving map. <clears throat> the only difference to the situation that we had in the last video is now that this map maps between tensor products of Hilbert spaces. But all the, the, all the properties of the map, they still hold even if the Hilbert space is a tensor product. We will have a look at a special case of, um, of the evolution of composite systems, which is when the evolution only takes place on one of the subsystems and the other subsystem is left invariant. So on the other subsystem, basically the identity evolution is applied. And one interesting example of such an evolution is actually the partial trace. This is also called the discarding channel. So if we consider the partial trace as a quantum channel, then this um, means that the quantum channel on the B system, for example, is the partial trace and the evolution on the A system is just the identity. We can then, so if you apply the definition of the partial trace, then we know we have to take the sum over the, the basis states of the B system, and then we can calculate the partial trace. This is exactly as we have described it before. And now from this um, formula, we can see what the Krauss operators for the partial trace, uh, so the Krauss operators for the discarding channel. They are just the identity tensor, the basis state on Bob's system. And we have one Krauss operator for every basis state. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the last thing that we, I want to talk about in this video is the no cloning theorem, where a composite system actually appeared. And the no cloning theorem is about copying or perfectly copying unknown quantum states. So suppose we want to build a machine, which is a unitary U that has as an input a pure state psi, like any pure state, and the output are two perfect copies of this pure state. Okay, the no cloning theorem, as the title says, states that building such a machine is impossible. And this is uh, very fortunate for quantum key distribution, because if we could build such a machine, then Eve could use this machine and copy all the states Alice is sending, give one copy to Bob and keep one of the copies. And neither Alice nor Bob would notice this. Okay, but why is it forbidden to build such a machine? Well, the answer is the linearity of quantum mechanics. This is actually quite easy to prove by a simple contradiction, which we will see now. So consider we have a general qubit state psi, which is given as a linear combination of state zero and one. And we put the state into this cloning machine. Then mathematically the following happens. So the unitary U is applied to the qubit set psi that we input, and we also have an ancilla qubit that we denote zero here. You could denote it any way you want because it is just replaced by the second copy of psi in the end. <clears throat> okay, so we apply the copier to the state psi and get two copies of psi. And if you write that out, given the linear combination that we have for psi, then we, in the end, we get a formula with four two qubit states, well, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, with different uh, amplitudes. Okay, this is like 
mathematically very straightforward. But this is not the only way how we can um, calculate the action of this copier. So when we apply u to the state psi, then we could also first insert the linear combination that we are given for psi. And then because, uh, because quantum mechanics is linear, because u is a unitary, which is a linear map, then we can not like we can calculate the linear combination of u applied to the basis state 0 and 1, as you can see here. And then we get a completely different result in the end. We then have the linear combination alpha times 0, 0 plus beta times 1, 1. And these two expressions are in general not equal. Actually, there are only very few cases in which they are equal, which is if alpha is equal to 1 and beta is equal to 0, or the other case, alpha is equal to 0 and beta is equal to 1. And these are exactly uh, classical states. And for classical states, it's perfectly fine. You can always perfectly copy classical states. But all the other cases, which represent the quantum states, for them, these two expressions are not equal, and therefore such a universal copier cannot exist. So that was the no cloning theorem, which is really important to quantum key distribution. We have also talked about how we describe composite systems and how entanglement arises in these composite systems in this video. And next time, I promise, we are going to talk about entropies. Because entropies will be really important when we talk about the security of quantum key distribution. So thank you for watching. I hope you have learned something in this video and I hope to see you next time.